You know, I debated what to make this video. At first I thought maybe I'd do the Mechanicus. I mean, they're cool as all hell and one of 40k's most interesting factions. And I thought about maybe the Tau, because despite what dead memes and Imperial fanboys say, the Tau in their own way are yet another one of 40k's most interesting factions. But you know what? As I was writing this script, I decided that sometimes what people want isn't something interesting. Like characters and philosophies and motivations and whatever else there might be. Sometimes what you want is to go monkey mode with a 40 foot tall robot piloted by a medieval knight turning a demon beyond time, space and human comprehension into sludge. Some chivalrous madman that seems like he's displaced in time as he goes on about glory and knightly honor while he pilots a mech suit with a laser machine gun. Doesn't that sound like something you can get behind? If it doesn't, then you are a boring human being and I wish to never meet you. But if it does sound interesting to you, then allow me to show you the glory of the Imperial Knights. But before I start droning on, I need to let you know that this video is sponsored by none other than R -R -R Raid Shadow Legends. That's right, I am here once more to tell you about the fun and free RPG that you can play right now on your phone. And this is a special promotion. And you know why? It's because, and I cannot tell you enough how happy it makes me, it's all about elves this time. Oh, ho, 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 it's elf time, baby. Hi, elf time specifically, the most glorious of elves to be found. Let me tell you some lore about Raid's elves, because I will take literally any opportunity to shove elves down people's throats and Raid has provided me with one. See, Thousands of years ago, in the wonderful world of Raid, the High Elves had a glorious kingdom. It was a High Elf kingdom, therefore you automatically know it was better than every other kingdom by leaps and bounds. Then some jerk named Seeroth started convincing a few of them that unlimited power and shadow magic were toast the best thing ever, guys, and an elven civil war began. Doesn't this sound familiar, my Warhammer fanbase? But unlike the Asur, the High Elves in Raid aren't dying out after the civil war started. They are specifically stated to be the brightest, richest, and most powerful nation in Teleria to this day. And you know what, viewer? This makes my elf-loving self feel inner peace. And the Elven Heroes of Raid certainly live up to that legacy. If there's a role in the battlefield you need filled, rest assured there's an elf champion to fill that role. Because there's an elf for every occasion. I don't care what the dwarves say, they're wrong and elves are the best. My favorite high elf is one that was actually talked about the last time I talked about Raid, Deliana. Sport heroes and games are always my thing because I'm bad at actually playing video games and like to just hang back and help other people be good. And Deliana is perfect for someone like me. Plus, again, elf, I'll be honest with you, even though she's a hell of a champion, she could be garbage and I'd still love her and entirely because of Elf. Now of course there's more to raid this month than just Elves, as much as it pains me to have to stop talking about my precious Elves. There's a non-stop barrage of special events and activities, including Forge Pass Season 3 that can get you some pretty damn spicy rewards, such as a limited edition artifact set. Now that's spicy. But of course there's more for such as the power of Raid Shadow Legends. There's also new champions and some fan-free fantastic looking skins for Madame Saris. What more need I say, the skins speak for themselves. And finally, the single most important piece of Raid news I can possibly deliver. Death Knight, the Skeleton tonight that keeps getting relentlessly bullied in trailers for Raid is finally becoming a super powered legendary version of himself. And I just gotta tell you right now, heart to heart, I cried a little bit when I found out the guy was finally getting what he deserved. If you haven't, then you should absolutely download Raid Shadow Legends. If you somehow aren't convinced by what I've said so far, then I don't think you've been listening to me, but here's something extra to sweeten the deal. If you click my link in the description or the QR code presently on screen right now staring you in the face, you'll get $30 worth of rewards for free. You'll get Tayrell, who's yet another glorious high elf, as well as 200,000 silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and an ancient shard to get yet another amazing champion right away. Who knows, fate may even smile on you and bless you with another elf. These rewards will all be waiting for you right here in the inbox. Rewards are only available for the next 30 days and for new players only, so glory to the high elves, download Raid Shadow Legends now, and I'll see you there. Now that we've wrapped that up, it's time to talk about the giant, stompy robots killing everything ever. Imperial Knights, unlike almost everything else in the modern day of 40k, are a damn near untouched and undegraded piece of dark age of technology equipment. In the lost ages of 40k's history, Imperial Knights served a dual purpose to ancient humanity's efforts to colonize the galaxy. One of those purposes is rather easy to see. A big giant stompy robot is going to be really effective at defending your burgeoning space colony. Some aliens or demons invade, try to eat some humans, and then a steampunk Evangelion blasting a warhorn sends them straight back to hell. But as it turns out for whatever reason, humanity in 40k built its war machines to serve dual purpose as construction equipment as well. The chainsaw a knight comes equipped with is great for sawing down forest to build a home with. A battle cannon can level a mountain to make more space, and their massive robot hands can pick things up and move them around like the sickest grain in existence. They still weren't quite the knights we know and love today, though. Initially, they were just war machines slash construction equipment, depending on the day, with the AI system of the mech making the pilot feel a bit more protective towards his colony. And then the Age of Strife happened. Warp travel became impossible because of the horny space elves clocking up the soul traffic, rendering every human colony more than a solar system away from each other completely isolated. This is when the knights became truly knights and 
more than just name, as many of these worlds found themselves slipping back into feudalistic societies as a result of being completely cut off from each other. By the time the Imperium was formed and these night worlds were being rediscovered, most of them were back to ye olden times with all the broken English and jousting tournaments that implies, just with a Gundam instead of a horse. The Throne Mechanicum, the system a knight's pilot hooks themselves up to, is what caused these knights to feel protective of their colonies and take on a role of guardianship. Over time, however, when combined with the regressing technology of these isolated worlds, it caused the pilots to view themselves as medieval knights of noble houses. It's not that the Throne Mechanicum invents a fantasy world for these knights to hallucinate themselves in, since the worlds they come from are usually both medieval and feudal in nature. But when you combine that with the falling level of technology, you get people firmly believing in the ideals of chivalry, honorable combat, and sleeping with their sister to preserve the family bloodline, all while they're in a mech. You might be wondering why they all coincidentally return to roughly the exact same level of medieval technology. There are naturally several different reasons for this. One is the Games Workshop can't be bothered to give us different looks for models, see also 90% of the Imperial Guard apparently all being Catacan or Cadian. Another potential explanation is that the way the Throne Mechanicus alters the mind of a knight's pilot is just naturally conducive to a feudalistic environment. And given that they were the ones in the giant robot suit, if the knights wanted feudalism, they were gonna get feudalism. Or perhaps it's because feudalism is roughly the minimum part of the tech tree where you can make the individual parts that make the knight work, like gears and whatnot, even though you sure as hell don't understand how it makes it work. For whatever reason, if you find a planet of people with an abundance of stompy robots that aren't quite titans, assume they'll be big fans of serfdom and castles. As these planets were rediscovered during the Great Crusade, they swore fealty to either the Imperium as a whole, the Mechanicum, or a specific Titan Legion for a variety of reasons. One very common reason, of course, being that a civilization consisting mostly of dirt farmers that think bathing lets in evil spirits don't know how to maintain Jack. So they accepted the Imperium's offer when they came in and said, hey guys, join us and we'll reintroduce you to the wondrous world of duct tape. So these planets rejoined humanity, sometimes vassalizing themselves out of the Mechanicum instead of the Imperium, and have faithfully served the armies of mankind ever since. Sure, when Horus threw his temper tantrum, a few of them joined the forces of evil, and every now and then a knight gets a bit murder-happy and joins corn or something, but those are fringe cases. Fringe cases granted being entire planets of the bastards, but it's 40k, what do you expect? This video has been too light on funny jokes so far, so allow me to tell you about what happens when you learn how to become a knight. An aspiring noble pilot will begin the ritual of becoming, whereupon he will bond to his knight's machine spirit. Sometimes when this happens, the pilot's head explodes. Generally, it is agreed upon that the aspirant has failed the ritual if this happens. If this doesn't happen, then congratulations. You now have a massive war machine that you're just so damn bonded with it might as well be a second skin. A second skin with cannons the size of houses on it, but a second skin nonetheless, who said mechs couldn't be comfortable. When becoming a proper knight, the throne mechanicum you are bonded to also introduces positive feelings towards the concepts of fealty, hierarchy, and one's ancestors. This is because these feelings means they're going to defend their colony that much harder, and also because Games Workshop is a British company and therefore views concepts such as social mobility in the same way most people view intestinal parasites. The knight then has to endure the rigors of court life, including but not limited to ceremonies that last longer than a planet's day, political intrigue that usually results in the death of at least a few dozen minor nobles, and other feudal dangers like the plague and malnutrition. It's in the name, after all, these knights still live on feudal worlds. Very frequently, the knight suit itself is one of the only pieces of technology beyond what medieval Earth would have on these planets. With that in mind, it's no wonder that whenever the Imperium or Mechanicus sends out the call to war to the knights, they trip over themselves to get to the first transport off world. I mean, what would you rather do? Go on a grand tour to improve your house's standing and gain glory? Or sit and listen to someone list titles for three hours before discussing how the grain harvest has gone down 3.54%? I mean, come on now, we're not the Imperial Fist or anything here. And thus do these LARPing demigods march to the name of the God Emperor of Mankind. As always, there's a whole lot more background lore if you really want to hear it, but I'm gonna be honest with you right now. That's more or less everything important as far as I care. Medieval nobles get bonded to a massive war machine that makes them feel extra passionate about chivalry and going to renaissance fairs. That's all the background you need for the Imperial Knights. So from a lore perspective, why go for the several dozen foot tall killing machine? Well, that's as good a reason as any, I say. For starters, who doesn't like Pacific Rim? Because that's what it's like to rock a knight. You're gonna punch a greater demon in the face and then style on its corpse. Oh, is there a fortress wall in the way of the Imperial Guard? It just so happens that you're the perfect battering ram. Knights are called into the biggest and baddest situations to walk into an enemy formation and make some room, so if you want to be the center of all the action, then the knights are the army for you. The knights are also willing to work alongside pretty much anyone and have anyone in their ranks. Admittedly, I was talking about how they love their rigid social hierarchies and royal courts, so your average knight probably is going to be too supportive of things like social mobility, or not stepping on peasants like shag carpets. But that being said, anyone who's a noble can come and get their very own battle mech, and they'll happily fight alongside any Imperial force. Imperial Guard Army requesting aid? The knights are happy to answer the call of those less equipped for war than they are. Space Marines requesting assistance against the forces of chaos? The knights would be honored to assist the sons of the Emperor in such a mission. Mechanicus requires protection while searching for Archaeotech? Well, the average knight probably doesn't 
know about gas heating, let alone ancient gravity technology, but they'll be there anyways. There's no human army that wouldn't be happy to fight alongside a knight, and vice versa. No situation in the lore that knight wouldn't feasibly be involved in some way. Even a stealth mission, because what better way to sneak in undetected than having metal Aaron Jaeger causing a scene on the other side of the base? And if you like 40k's unique blend of ancient tradition slash aesthetics mixed with futuristic technology, then the knights are perhaps the ultimate representation of it. I mean, they're battle mechs the size of houses that are also chivalrous knights fighting for their honor and going on quests in the name of home and the emperor. You can't get more Imperium than that. You can also play the morality of the knightly houses however you want. Wanna go full grimdark future on everyone? Then have the knights be brutal oppressive overlords who bully the peasants beneath them and only ever do anything because it improves their standing and power. Make it Game of Thrones but with Mecha. On the other hand, it's equally valid to imagine your knight army as the most idealized King Arthur ripoff bastions of chivalry in the galaxy. Men and women who save the common man from the forces of chaos, win the respect of chapters like the Salamanders because of how damn nice they are, and even make friends with the perfidious Eldar because they're just that cool. The entire spectrum of morality is open to the knights, there's no need to lock yourself into either good or evil. And of course, if you like the idea of Mecha but don't want it to be aggressively anime, here's especially the army for you. Now don't get me wrong, I like me some anime. I've got a Dragon Ball Z tattoo and I've been listening to the opening to your boy Kong Ming regularly lately because it's just so catchy. And then I lie and say it's a Jojo opening or something to look like slightly less of a clown if anyone asks, but you know, that's unrelated. But sometimes I don't want Gundam even if I still want a giant mech. Well in that case you can't get better than the knights for that. I mean you can get a titan I guess, but for some reason people have the crazy idea that it's better to spend your money on food and shelter rather than Forge World products. I know, I don't get it either, but that's just how some people are. I want to really quickly go on a tangent about humanity's technology in 40k, because the knights are one of the most awesome aspects of it. It's all based on the idea that older is better, because Dark Age humanity had some bus in technology and it's never been fully recreated since the Age of Strife. The knights embody older is better in two very interesting ways. For one, the STC for Imperial Knights is almost completely uncorrupted. That means that unlike almost any other army in modern 40k, the Imperial Knights are a glimpse of just what ancient humanity could do. And what they could do is kick ass. And since it's undegraded, they can keep making more of them, so there's no fear of this army running out of troops and supplies. The other way they show older is better is that throne mechanicus thingy. When someone bonds with a knight, a little bit of their personality is absorbed into the suit. 40k being what it is, part of their soul may damn well be a part of it as well. So not only are you piloting advanced Dark Age tech, you get the wisdom and knowledge of all the previous pilots too. Given that oftentimes it's familial lines who end up driving these monsters, there's decent odds that Graham and Gramp are the ones telling you how to fight, which I gotta be honest is probably a real morale booster. You're doing great, Sonny. Don't forget to eat your vegetables and remember to burn all the orc spores so no more of them pop up. I mean, I think that'd be awesome. Lastly, the models are just... I don't even have words for it, just look at them. I know they all come from the same base kit and that this is a flaw worth mentioning, but that one base kit is absolutely stunning. And there are the armager units that look a bit different and are smaller so as to give a sense of scale to your knights. No sense being big if you don't know what you're big in relation to after all. The weapons, the armor, the little shield that serves literally no purpose but to have a coat of arms put on it, absolutely stunning. And the best part is, you can paint them simply or incredibly intricately and it'll look great either way. Now for tabletop reasons, I'll just get to the point, these things are powerful, stronger than greater demons in fact. I'm not making that up just because I hate chaos, here are the stat lines for a knight paladin, probably the most basic of the knight options, and a bloodthirster. Sure, in some ways the bloodthirster is better, higher leadership, more attacks at first, better to hit rolls, and he's a bit faster. Other than that, the knight is equal to, if not better than the bloodthirster in every other way. The knight has a vastly more varied loadout, which means you have a lot of versatility compared to a greater demon, each of which usually has a shtick they're gonna stick to. The knight is pretty good in both range and melee, so it can weaken the bloodthirster and still be capable of fighting at a close range. Sure, a bloodthirster is probably going to win if they start right next to each other, especially if the cornflake goes first, but that's what the ranged weapons are for. The save is the same, and depending on the weapon loadout, the knight can hit just as hard as the bloodthirster, or a bit weaker than it can. And to top it all off, the knight not only has a whole lot more wounds, but its degrading stat line is more generous than the bloodthirsters, at least in my opinion. Because of the extra wounds, it takes a lot longer to drop down the track, and while the penalty to its two hit rolls is a lot steeper than the bloodthirster, it doesn't lose any of its attacks, which the bloodthirster does. The point of that whole lecture is that I still hate corn and always will outside of Total War, but also also, the knights are strong as hell. Almost anything 1v1 is gonna go in the knight's favor, or at the very least, the knight is still gonna have a fighting chance. Sure, Kane can one-tap these things, I mean he can one-shot a Warhound Titan, but the thing about that is most models in the game aren't Kane. Knights indeed perform very well against low model count armies for that reason. Even the custodies, golden bodyguards of god that they are, really struggle against the knights in terms of direct combat. Of course, there's a downside to this that we'll cover later, but purely in terms of combat, yeah, the knights are pretty much unmatched. Especially because most armies have a couple big units that hit really 
really hard, whereas you have a couple small units that still hit hard. Speaking of, the knights also have a smaller backup type of mini knight, the armager. There's only two types, a shooty one and a stabby one, but they're perfect for working as a screen for the knights and either drawing fire or taking advantage of the knight's presence to slip into a flanking position and penetrate the rear line. As is fitting to their lore, an imperial knight can also make the perfect ally in another imperial army. What you might lose in terms of abilities that require a mono faction army, you gain in having a giant mech suit stopping across the battlefield and blowing away everything else to kingdom come. Knights are also scary. This sounds like a nothing statement, but hear me out. Think again about units like Kane, Greater Demons, or fittingly enough for this video, a Wraith Knight. Once one of those is on the tabletop, it dominates the board. To some extent, the other player is always going to have to keep it in mind because of how powerful these things are, even if they're confident that they can take it down with their own anti-armor. It at the very least will heavily play into how they deploy their forces because these bigger kinds of models can wreck shop if they aren't taken into account properly. Now take that mindset and apply it to an army that's nothing but these big units. If the opponent only has a few anti-armor options, they're going to be terrified of these things on the tabletop purely because of a knight army's raw power. To once again go off on a tangent, Beefgate is a term that means an entryway constructed out of cow meat. Less schizophrenically, in a video game, a Beefgate is a monster that keeps you out of higher level areas in a game. You gotta know what you're doing and gear up before you're ready to go through. That's kind of what an Imperial Knight is to new Warhammer players. Until someone has a handle on what they're doing with Warhammer 40k as a game, when they see someone plop down three nightmare frames on the table and say, I am ready to start the game now, they're gonna have no idea what to do. Even against more experienced players, Knights can still cause some anxiety because of their capabilities. And against newer players, they just flat out might not have the models to deal with one of these things. There's a reverse of this that I'll get into in the flaws section as before, but the main thing to take note of is that Knights are scary both for the minis who have to take morale test against them and the other player who knows he has to fight against several of these giant models. If you want to bully someone just getting into the hobby, play Knights. That'll make you friends. Lastly, the Imperial Knights are actually one of the cheapest armies to collect. Now, I'm sure you're gonna go look at the prices on the web store and tell me in the comments that I'm out of my insulin deprived mind, but it's true. Because you only need a few Knights and some Armagers for a complete army, those price tags amount to only a few purchases and you're done. Hell, if you mostly just play smaller point games, buy a single Knight and a box or two of Armagers and you're good to go. Easy to paint, assemble, and get a game with them. Knights are, in my opinion, a pretty good army for new players. In fact, while making this, part of me now wishes I went with Knights for an army, but my elves himself just couldn't let that happen. But even these glorious heroes have flaws in both lore and tabletop. It'll be a bit lighter here than usual do or don'ts for the lore flaws because mech suits are awesome, but a good starting place is a lore positive I said earlier. If you don't like 40k's science fiction mixed with past aesthetics, you really won't like the Knights, because even beyond them all acting like Knights, they look like a robotic version of a Knight. Battletech has House Kurita looking like Samurai, and even they don't go as hard on the aesthetics, because at least there it looks like they made a robot suit to look like a samurai. The Imperial Knights are almost the opposite of that. It's like they tried to turn a suit of knightly armor into a mecha. So if you don't like that kind of thing, don't go for the Imperial Knights. Beyond that, usually in lore the Knights are supporting other armies when they're involved. Whether that be because they've sworn direct fealty to a Titan Legion, or they're just lending a helping hand, it generally plays out as the Knights are assisting X faction and not the reverse. While it is a good thing to give someone a helping hand, it can appear like the factions of this army don't have much agency of their own. So if you want your army to be the master of their own destiny, then again, you might not want these guys. And I'll be honest here, I'm out of flaws I see that are obvious. I'm sure some won't say in the comments that knights are a huge hassle for logistics and stuff, and they're right, that is a flaw. It's just a flaw that I don't really care to touch upon because when I'm playing a war game set in a universe called Warhammer, that's not what I'm really focusing on, you know? Unless it's about the Eldar and stuff or comparing it to Slipspace, of course, because in that case it helps my incredibly biased argument. But tabletop? Yeah, there's some flaws there. That power I talked about comes with a hefty price tag. In the Bloodthirster comparison from earlier, the knight costs almost double the points. So while the knights got an edge up on the competition power-wise, it's not something you just get for free. They're a hell of a thing on the tabletop, but there's never going to be more than a dozen models in your army, and that's only if you have armagers in your force. If you don't have armagers, you'll have like three or four, realistically. You're going to always be heavily outnumbered, and while this does simplify things like moving and choosing what to do with your models, it also leads into two further problems. One is that objectives are almost a lost cause. Even the custodians have more objective capturing power, and they're probably the second smallest army in the game. And if you're up against something like the Tyranids, you better just hope that all those dice rolls turn out well, because otherwise those dozens of models aren't going to be sharing that objective with you. Granted, the knight can just, you know, kill the models, but if for whatever reason you can't, you're going to have to learn to say goodbye to those victory points. Two is that if you lose a single model, you're up shit's creek without a paddle. That can be a third or fourth of your army right there, so while you can throw them into a situation and they'll kick some ass, you need to know what they can and can't do. Because if you don't and you throw these guys to the wind, it might cost you the game. Anti-armor weapons in particular are going to be the bane of your existence. It's even worse because if you're fighting, say, the guard, you might have to chew through a lot of infantry before you can get rid of their anti-armor. And that's disregarding the fact that a hundred lasguns might do you in on their own, or if the army's mobility is high enough to avoid the knights, such as the Eldar. While 12 inches of movement is a lot, the Eldar aren't exactly going to have problems keeping up with staying away from that. 
Also, remember how I said knights are intimidating to newer players, especially if they don't have the models to deal with it? Here's a tier list, and you can see the knights are smack dab in the middle of tier 3. While all tier lists are subjective, I mean, after all, DGD should be triple S tier in Smash 5, you know, because he's just the best. The point is that knights stop being nearly as intimidating once you know what you're doing, because there's pretty much only a few things each of them can do. More experienced players are going to be able to counter the knights based on their experience with the game, so that's something you're going to have to keep in mind. You're not just getting an auto win button with the Imperial Knights. Lastly, while knight armies overall are cheaper than most others, you're spending a lot at once on them. A guard army is going to bankrupt you over time, but the knights will do it all at once with the $170 price tag. Before taxes, of course. Gotta help if you choose Forge World Knights. <laughs> just... Just buy a Titan if you're going in on this guy, do yourself a favor. Unrelated, but I like how the frequently bought together items are both paintbrushes for the knight. Like, usually it'll be something like Guardians, Farseer, Wraith Guard, or something like that, but here, they know. They know you're just getting this monster. And that should just be about the... That should just be about the... Fucking... Why am I having problems here? That's what you need to know for the knights, okay? Big stompy robots that ironically might be best used as support for another army, but by God, is the enemy gonna feel it either way when these guys take to the table. Beautiful paint jobs, beautiful stats, overall, great army. I like it, and I don't know how to end this sentence, so I'm just gonna end the video now. Thank you, as always, to my wonderful channel members. You are the armager to my knight, providing me with the help I need to reach my prime. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to consider consider subscribing or becoming a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. I think I missed a few references to other big mechs in fiction in this video, so let me just fix that real quick. Alright, let's see. There's 86, 86, Gurren Lagann. Uh, there's gotta be something else, right? Does War of the Worlds count? The tripod sound counts. That's awesome as hell, but I don't know if they themselves count. Whatever, big robots are cool and you should watch everything they're in. Also, Pacific Rim is a masterpiece. I'm not, that. that's just not up for debate.